our third recording is now, it's, it's being recorded, uh, officially starting this very timely, very important webinar. Um, the, the reason why the seafarers have been so much in the news these days is the so-called crewing crisis. Now, crew changes have always been difficult. And, uh, and I, um, I know from a bit of experience, having worked a bit in seafarer with some shipping company. And so crew changes have always been difficult, not just when and how a seafarer can leave a ship. You need to make him coincide with when the other seafarer arrives. Um, and ships today spend just one third of time in port. Historically, it was two thirds of time in port. After 9-11, this was getting even more difficult. Um, so it, it was already difficult to do this, um, to change crews, and it has now been extremely difficult in times of COVID. And this adds to a lot of issues that seafarers are facing. So without any further ado, uh, we have opportunities later on to say about, Regina will share what we have done it with our UNCTAD report, our work. I want to go straight to Steve Cotton from the International Transport Workers Federation. And I believe um, you and your colleagues will share an introductory presentation about the issues we want to discuss today. Steve, you have the floor. Well, first, yeah, and thank you for the opportunity to address everybody and uh, welcome everyone. I'll try to make this as, uh, as, as brief and as comprehensive as possible, but it's quite a big subject. So uh, first I'll tell you a little bit about the ITF. So we are um, truly a global union federation and we were founded um, in, uh, in, in Rotterdam by uh, dockers striking and the seafarers refusing to um, cross a picket line in 1896. From those early days of uh, industrial solidarity, that was British, that was Dutch dockers and British seafarers, um, we've built our capacity in all of the transport modes. So ship ports, shipping, inland waterways, fisheries, railways, road, tourism, and civil aviation. And of course, we continue to, to battle to um, improve the opportunities for women in transportation and recognize that our, our young workers also need more space, particularly with the impact of COVID. Um, our unions represent um, 18 million transport workers in all of those sectors. And we have quite a, a, a unique global network of nearly 150 ITF inspectors who uh, visit ships, both those covered with ITF approved collective bargaining agreements and also um, those that are uncovered and particularly throughout this COVID period have been there to provide not just um, industrial support but frankly well-being and counselling and other issues that we'll talk a little bit as we go through the presentation. So moving to the next slide, um, you'll, you'll, you'll see that the impact of the crew crisis and, and Jan said it, I think we have to recognise um, shipping is quite a fragmented in industry um, and by its culture um, the, the, the seafarers are international and of course we're right at the cutting edge of globalised economies and many of the seafarers come from the global south and of course when Covid hit and national governments shut their borders and civil aviation which is also something we represent ground to a halt, this created massive tensions on an already fragile supply chain. So what do we, what, what's, what's been the reality on board ships? Historically, seafarers of whatever nationality, whatever flag the ships are covered, have been able to have um, an understanding that wherever you are in the world, you can get off and have shore leave, but you can also rely on medical attention. Um, and through COVID, we've seen quite extreme realities where those historical rights have not, not been allowed. Again, we, at the beginning of this crisis, we understood national governments shutting their boundaries and protecting their citizens. But 20 months later, we're very frustrated that we haven't been able to find solutions. And I have to say and put on record, many of our colleagues are online on the panel, um, the UN agencies have done everything they can to help 
but we've seen that the rule of law doesn't always hold out. I think we should talk a little bit about the impact on everybody as a result of COVID, a dramatic change in, in, in lives, shutting down people, but imagine uh, a seafarer and, and, and at its peak, we had 400,000 seafarers over contracts. Now contracts can be anything from one month and under the ILO's uh, interpretation of the Maritime Labour Convention up to 11 months. At some stages throughout the last two years, we've had 18 months contracts. And imagine your workplace is the same place every day. You can't get off board the vessel with the same people has had a significant impact on people's well-being. We've also been working again with the ILO and the IMO, International Labour Organization, International Maritime Organization on abandonments, and we've seen the numbers triple in 2020. Um, so we've seen the impact on, again, um, companies struggling financially. And of course, this is irrespective of the fact that if you have 400,000 seafarers on board ships, you have 400,000 seafarers at home waiting to get back and therefore to, to earn money. And of course, I could give you some numbers about, um, you know, we represent nearly a million seafarers, 80% of the world's trade is carried on ships. And the impact on, 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 on the countries that provide the seafarers is also enormous, probably 30% um, or more of the world's seafarers are from the Philippines, and they contribute massively to the economic situation in that country. Moving to, to our reaction to the crisis, um, well, we are un unbiasedly a labour organisation and we're quite forthright in our responsibility to defend workers' rights and to be at the table as the world continues to change. But we have throughout this, this period worked very collaboratively with the ship owners. Um, we've worked very collaboratively, as I mentioned, with all the UN agencies. Um, and we've tried to produce um, practical solutions. So, for example, together with the International Chamber of Shipping, we've produced protocols that are registered at the IMO um, and we've rolled those out. We've worked with um, the Global Maritime Forum together on a Neptune declaration, which was about getting the world shipping companies to sign up and guarantee that we would, would look after seafarers. And we've also taken the, the fight, if that's the right word, to... Um, the world's economic players, so, so the people that use shipping and say many of these situations means you're you're on the verge of human trafficking because seafarers cannot get out of their contracts and we need to do more. And of course, we've also issued guidance on what's a bona fide test. We had periods when there were a lot of fraudulent tests going around. We worked very hard with the WHO to recognize the PCR testing and now we're driving incredibly hard uh, together with the support of the Secretary General of the UN to get COVAX to recognise that seafarers have to be treated as key workers. I'll talk a little bit more about that, but as a result, get priority vaccinations. Moving to the key worker status, we held uh, a number of um, governmental meetings where we got governments to sign up to the recognition that seafarers are critical to our global supply chain, moving foodstuffs, personal protection equipment, the medical equipment necessary to roll out vaccines, and all the other things our societies rely on. Um, unfortunately, we've only got 64 countries. It's good, but it's not good enough. And also, there hasn't been enough recognition that the key status, um, and we would expand that key status to all transport workers in the supply chain, not just seafarers, um, should, should come with benefits that means you can move cross-border and, and be recognised as, as part of the process. Um, but there are governments that we're working with, Singapore's just, just as we speak, uh, agreeing to vaccinate seafarers on arrival, small project at the moment, we hope it will expand. We're talking to the Qataris about using Qatar uh, and Doha Airport as a, as a vaccination hub, and they're prepared to release some of their own allowances for vaccinations. We genuinely believe in the ITF, more needs to be done on trips waivers and and giving a global solution when it comes to vaccines. Um, and that's critical and something that we're campaigning at, at the highest level to see a, 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 a worldwide mobilization of vaccinations. Moving to the next slide, I'm quite aware that I probably talk a little bit too much. Um, <laughs> there's a few experts on this call that I would say know much more about the Maritime Labour Convention than I, uh, by far colleagues at the ILO and Cleo, who's kind of considered can I call you the mother of the MLC, Cleo, without causing any offence? And she did so much work on that. I think 
we should just mention that maritime has perhaps the most powerful ILO convention that is seen as a global safety net. But we have to say that um, the tremendous work to get it in place and to negotiate it, it has been under great strain over these last 20 months as many countries haven't enforced it to the letter. And that's given us some point of concern. Particularly, I think all of us respect the, the, the laws of our nations and the international rules and regulations. The Maritime Labour Convention is supposed to guarantee decent working and living conditions, safe and secure workplaces, repatriation, shore leave and medical assistance. And irrespective of countries trying, nobody has been able to fully implement the MLC because of the COVID pandemic. And that's something we're talking about with all of our partners and of course the ILO itself. So it's critical for us that we look at what didn't work and we find ways to, to reinforce. As I said, and I'm saying pretty much everywhere I go, that the reality has to be that um, governments now, governments have to come with solutions. So I'll just move to my final slide and just talk a little bit about what we hope to happen. Um, seafarers, I think, transport workers, after the first responders throughout this pandemic, have been heroes that have kept our societies moving. They've put food in our, in our supermarkets, they've kept the supply chains going, and perhaps for the first time, society recognises the critical role transport workers and seafarers, irrespective of which country they come from, provide for everyone. And we've been calling and we will continue to call until we see a proper solution, global solutions, that more support needs to be given by national governments to facilitate crew change. Key status, yes, but access to get on and off vessels. I think the question about ensuring there's not so many seafarers. There's you know, two million max and which million at one at ship at sea on one stage. Surely in our global society, with all the benefits of globalization and the economic improvements we've achieved, we must be able to give priority access to seafarers and then the boosters that we'll need as we battle and come to live with, um, with the, the COVID pandemic and the consequences. And then again, I think, um, you know, the rule of law is fundamental Trade unionists will constantly fight to improve their working men and women's opportunities and particularly women and young people. But the reality is we have to respect the law. And uh, the ITF will continue together with all of our partners. And yesterday we did a very big uh, promotion with um, IATA representing civil aviation, ICS representing seafarers, uh, ship owners, and I should say, and IRU representing the truck owners associations to demand that the transport workers get resolutions from government. So yeah, and I hope I didn't go too long. I thank you very much. I could go on and on and I'm happy to take any questions when we get to that, but I'm very keen to hear what the rest of the panel has to say. Thank you for the opportunity to address. And uh, again, I hope that was clear and, and yeah. helpful for the audience. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, uh, Steve. Very helpful, very clear, ni nice presentation to the point. Um, and so you mentioned the the Labour, Maritime Labour Convention. So let us move directly to the first panelist, which is Brandt Wagner from the International Labour Organization uh, to yeah, comment, complement as a panelist, this the topic and presentation. Brandt, you have the floor. Yeah, thanks, Jan. Thanks, Steve, and other panelists and people that are listening. Yeah, the, um, and, and Hello for everyone on World Maritime today, and this is a special day for shipping and seafarers. Uh, first, I think for those who don't know, I think most people know the ILO, but for those who don't know the ILO, we're the International Labor Organization. We're a specialized agency of the UN system, founded in 1919, and our focus is decent work, providing decent work. So we're focusing on people and work, and the uh, we're uniquely a tripartite organization, which means not only governments, but employers and workers, which would mean shipowners and seafarers representatives in this case, have a voice and a vote in all we do. Um, since the beginning of the pandemic, a number of countries, uh, governments, also shipowners and seafarers organizations have approached the ILO about how to apply the Maritime Labor Convention in light of the pandemic. 
Now, the Maritime Labor Convention has been referred to, and as you, as you was said, I, uh, we're here with the really, truly the mother of the Maritime Labor Convention, uh, Dr. Cleopatra uh, Dungia Henry, who can probably speak at much greater length and more eloquently about the convention that I can, but the, the most important thing I think here is that this convention, the Maritime Labor Convention, is the comprehensive convention that sets out the rights of seafarers, decent work of seafarers. It was uh, adopted in 2006, it was, and has been enforced for eight years. Uh, it's comprehensive in its nature. It's, it's considered the fourth pillar of international regulatory, the international regulatory regime for quality shipping. So this is really the convention setting out seafarers' rights. It's often for, referred to as the Seafarers Bill of Rights. It's been ratified by, uh, I think, over 91% of the uh, world's uh, fleet by tonnage. If you look at the countries that ratified it, they cover 92, 91, 92% of the world's fleet um, and, and 99 states. So this is a significant convention that's really approaching being universal. Um, I, I obviously, the, 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 the pandemic hit everybody. And uh, not only the pandemic itself, but of course, the things that governments did to prevent the spread of the pandemic, the public health authorities taking actions in order to contain the pandemic. And the result of that, of course, has been not only uh, health problems for seafarers from COVID, like so many others, but also the significant uh, problems uh, like uh, inability to conduct crew changes, lack of access to medical care ashore, uh, uh, lack of uh, medical equipment on board at one point, a lot of things. I mean, just many, it hit this, it's hit on many, the pandemic's hit on many, many parts of the convention. So anyway, back when the pandemic came out, the ILO was approached to, uh, you know, on this and how, how to apply the MLC, because the MLC was in a way a tool to prevent this mistreatment of seafarers during the pandemic. And the ILO, and a lot of work has been done. Steve referred to some of the work of the ILO, but we've had uh, guidance that's going out to member states on how to apply the MLC during the, during the pandemic. We've had uh, the uh, a general observation of our uh, most important body in the ILO supervisory system for the supervision of the application of conventions. The ILO Committee of Experts, they've come out with some very strong statements about the pandemic, about the need to fully apply the Maritime Labor Convention, pointing out many of the problems. Um, and this has been updated from time to time. In the beginning, there was sort of some flexibility because of the force majeure situation that's changed because we're no longer in a situation that's unforeseen or unforeseeable. Um, now, in addition to that, the ILO has produced a number of statements with together with the IMO on this, we've put out statements uh, pointing to the importance of seafarers being designated as key workers. Uh, this has been joint statements with IMO, with ILO, sometimes with UNCAD, also with uh, with uh, other uh, UN agencies. As was mentioned before, there's been a UN General Assembly resolution adopted about this issue. Um, I think it's being reviewed a bit this week at the UN General Assembly. In addition to that, the ILO has intervened in many cases with governments, specific governments were, that were seen as not applying the convention. So, for, for example, in the case of a seafarer not having access to medical care ashore, the ILO often at the request of shipowners and seafarers organizations would intervene and say, you're not complying with the Maritime Labor Convention. Please provide information. Please address the problem. So sometimes we got involved in individual uh, cases. The ILO is a special committee of the Maritime Labor uh, a special Committee of the Maritime Labor Convention, which met in April. This committee, among other things, it keeps the convention under review. It looked at the COVID situation. We adopted several resolutions which had set out certain actions in general about the COVID pandemic and also specific actions regarding vaccinations, making vaccinations available to seafarers. So there's been a lot here that's been done. Now, responding to what Steve said on some of these issues on the, um, on the impact, in addition to what he said, uh, I mean, uh, uh, and I, uh, we note that recently the BIMCO and, IS, uh, and ICS put out their new uh, Seafair Workplace re uh, report, which talks about supply and demand of seafarers. And it's already, that report was already showing a potential shortage in the number of seafarers, a you know, significant shortage, especially officers. And that 
if you throw the pandemic on top of that, it leads to a real problem because not only are we do we have the problems of seafarers now, but we have the problem of maybe not having people do this job in the future. They won't be attracted to it. They won't be retained. And uh, Steve, I think there was a mention of the article that just came out. Number uh, the statement by ICS, ITF, uh, IRU, and IATA, big organizations involved with transport, and they pointed out this problem. That this impact of this pandemic is not only the impact immediately on supply chains, but the long-term impact. Uh, on the issue of key workers, yes, we've been very strong in this issue, and I think more has to be fleshed out on the meaning of key workers in countries and actually bring into action. We've been pushing hard to make sure these protocols are used to actually uh, get seafarers moving to and from their ships. On the matter of access to vaccinations, again, we've had assembly, we've had ILO resolutions on this. Steve mentioned the COVAX system. One good development in July was the WHO has this uh, SAGE uh, roadmap for prioritizing use of COVID-19 vaccines in the case of limited supply. Before it didn't specifically mention seafarers, now it does, puts them in kind of the top 20% tile of who should get vaccinations. And that's something we help, we hope helps influence public health authorities to get vaccines to seafarers. Uh, but there are other problems as well, and I'll be very quick. Um, there's this problem of government agencies. You know, we, we know the labor ministries and maritime authorities understand this problem, but sometimes it seems to be, to be hard to penetrate the thinking of public health ministries and border control agencies and the importance of seafarers crossing borders and, uh, and, and accepting the documentation that they have, et cetera. There's a problem with interoperability of information on vaccination. So, and this is for all people who are cross-border workers, uh, where uh, they can't, you know, the, the systems don't, you, you have a, like on my phone, I have a, a Swiss uh, vaccination certificate. It may not be recognized when I cross the, the border tomorrow to go uh, to another country. Uh, we still have the problem of addressing medical care. Despite the fact that we've been working on this for a long time, we still have problems with seafarers are not allowed to go ashore for medical care, even if they don't have COVID. We've even had a serious problem of bodies being carried on ships of seafarers who unfortunately died at sea Sometimes taking uh, many, going through many ports before we can finally get a, a body of shore. And if you, I'm an ex-seafarer, if you are at sea for weeks with the body of your former captain on board the ship, this is extremely disturbing from a mental health point of view. So I'll leave it at that and um, come back on later. Any questions? Thanks. Thank you very much, uh, Brandt. Um, and now it's a particular pleasure to give the floor to our good old friend, sorry, long ago friend, uh, Cleopatra, <laughs> who was rightly called the mother of the convention when you were still working and living here in Geneva, not far from our UNCTAD offices, like not, not far where Brandt is still working. Now you are the president of the World Maritime University. Um, and actually, if time allows later on to go beyond the, the specific crew crisis, the, the challenges seafarers face in terms of automation, in terms of technological changes, other developments, which I know that uh, you and your, your professors and researchers at WMU have also looked at. But uh, anyhow, and at the same time, I'm asking everybody not to speak too long. So dear Cleo, the floor is yours. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Jan, for inviting me to attend this event. Um, clearly, um, COVID-19, <laughs> we all know what's done, what it has done. It just, in my view, has just magnified uh, the really already very difficult conditions that seafarers have been facing for a long time, uh, and certain ships better than in others, but uh, seafarers have, have really faced a lot of challenges. So COVID-19 has just magnified the issues more than anything else that one could um, have imagined. So I have some thoughts about concerns during these pandemic times. But at the same time, one of the things I realized was that we are in a USD 17 trillion industry. According to the International Chamber of Shipping. And seafarers today, we, it's still a very small group of specialized workers and probably about uh, well, safe, to be optimistic. So we, we, we add in, of course, 
uh, we're thinking that it's probably 1.8, a little bit over 1.8 if you include those working on board cruise ships. Don't forget for Dal ILO, and <laughs> I still feel think of it, it's my convention too. Um, these they were included in the MLC. Very important that we have that. But the current shipping market, and again, another issues that I look at is the current shipping market. And this market, with all of this mess that we're having, the shipping market is making a spectacular profit. High profits in some key sections of the industry, particularly container lines. What the pandemic has revealed, in my view, and exacerbated are the human and labor rights of seafarers. And it has shown, in my view, a spotlight on issues relating to their working and living conditions. Already it was bad, we think, you know, plus even if it was improving in a certain way, but it was bad. And the treatment of seafarers have not uh, improved and certainly have worsened in the process. So one of um, I, one of the major challenges that 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 occurs in the current context is the access to medical treatment. They had sea for long periods. Now they can't they can't disembark uh, from port. They can't transit and transfer. We've seen all of these issues. They've been really difficult for them. No vaccinations. How are we moving on on that? The difficulties again that many of them face and will continue to face relating to vaccinations and being able to be repatriated to go home or to return back on board ship in due time. Medic ports around the world are not offering medical care. And CFRS contracts have to be, I would say, unilaterally extended because the poor CFR hasn't got a choice in the matter. Inability to take shore leave, many challenges CFRS are facing. They're all working, many, many are working beyond the 11th month maximum under the MLC. <laughs> WMU did a recent study on hours of work and hours of rest. And that had nothing to do with the COVID-19 pandemic, even outside of that pandemic. Already hours of work and hours of rest showed excessive hours of work not in line with ILO and IMO requirements. What's going to happen to vaccinations for CFRs? Is the shipping industry and ITF together? A roadmap, I understand, is being put in place for vaccination of international CFRs. It is hoped that if that really is rolled out well, the disruption to international trade will be minimized and of course to the global supply chain as well. Question is, how are we going to get and provide this vaccination to CPRs to enable all of that to happen? I think we need a more ambitious and innovative approach to ensure the safety and well-being of our CPRs. We've got to think outside of the box. There must come a time where they should be able to continue to undertake crew changes and repatriation. Port and health port authorities, as well as health authorities, should really enable a swift disembarkation and repatriation of crew. Governments around the world should facilitate the delivery of supplies, such as medical supplies, water, and all of that, in terms of particularly in terms of provisions for ships. The ITF and I know the IBF, that's the International Bargaining Forum, have agreed to extend the contracts of CFRs, reflecting the exceptional circumstances. So again, here goes, the industry is making and, and the uh, unions are making a big effort there, in my view. I hope the IBF, in the framework of, I, of the IBF, that this uh, contractual arrangements would help reflect the exceptional circumstances, but should not be taken long into the future. So it is really temporary measures. And I'm sure uh, ITF will, will make sure, and Stephen will make sure that it doesn't go beyond that. 
The IMO came up with a 10 step plan to take action, to restart crew changes so that CFRs can disembark and a few crew and fresh crew deployed. Countries therefore must place, have in place processes and procedures to enable these crew changes to take place. I'm beginning to think of the post-pandemic world, human labor rights of CFRs. Right now, I think they're compromising their rights, but what's going to happen in the future with respect to the human and labor rights, the health and their well-being? How are we going to prioritize that we hope post pandemic. We've seen a lot of suicides at sea, mental issues, health issues, exacerbated by the crisis, not being able to go home to meet and see their families. The welfare support system for seafarers and particularly ashore has remained I mean, below expectations and which affects seafarers even more. I wish, therefore, to uh, join you and others to appeal to the international community, appeal to the maritime industry even more, to mobilize resources in order to create a sustainable welfare support system for CFRs. Probably they'll throw me in jail. Steve, you have to come and pull me out. <laughs> we have, <laughs> you know, to, if we have to retain seafarers, their labor and their human rights and their health and their welfare and their well-being must continue to be addressed holistically. And the organizations, the IMO, the ILO, UNCTAD, or the UN organizations and agencies should come together to push this issue far. Don't let it just you know, people will get complacent because, okay, it doesn't matter, it does, it's happening. Our CFRs today urgently need psychosocial emergency care. They need medical supplies in abundance. They need fuel, water, provisions, and unfortunately, too many of them have already been abandoned in ports. An emergency response mechanism, I am calling for one, <laughs> should be developed in order to enable an agile response to emergencies like this, emergencies like COVID-19 in the future. After this, these are among the reflections that have to be made. The MLC, my baby, we have 99 countries ratifying it right now. What are they doing to help protect our seafarers? Are we going to continue to extend their contracts of employment beyond the maximum 11 months provided for by the convention to enable them to be repatriated? And I've come up with a set of I'll call it three very important points. And then I'll start. One is to ensure the first one, compliance with the ILO MLC provisions. And in particular, the provisions relating to health protection, medical care, and welfare, including the right to repatriation. Two, accept the Seafarers Identity Documents Convention. SID, the SID, which people have forgotten about. That should be ex accepted along with their discharge books and this, you know, and the CFR employment agreements and you know, the letters of appointment uh, by maritime employers as evidence of them being professional seafarers, including when it comes to crew change, not to just throw them out. Permit them to disembark for crew change and repatriation in ports, to transit and transfer through the territory to an airport, and to implement approved, approved protocols and screening uh, mechanisms under these protocols for those who wish to disembark and go home. 
It is therefore an appeal that I join all of you and we're all on the same page on this, that we should all make a very collective appeal to countries that have not yet ratified the MLC, because everybody must come on board. We still have in 99. The ILO has 170 countries, IMO, or 72. We have a lot of countries still to ratify the MLC. So that the human and labor rights of seafarers would be fully protected and implemented in law and in practice. And finally, I would say, the international maritime community and the industry should continue to concentrate on developing seafarers competencies and their capacities. Priority should be given to seafarers from developing countries. Education today is a powerful tool and it can be an effective solution responding to the present pressing challenges that the world is facing. Education and capacity building. I'm coming from my academic hat right now. Of a global cadre of future maritime leaders is at the heart of the mission of WMU as an international postgraduate institution established in the framework of the IML. A tool, a, a huge tool, an important tool that can be effectively used and I'm trying to use it with all our students who are coming at a, a senior level and going back home to make sure they make a change, a sea change, all of us together and they take forward to ensure that seafarers, wherever, when they come into their ports, they are well received, they are protected and they are provided for. I'll stop here, but what I would say as, a, as a, to end my comments here, it is essential for the international community to provide financial support in our trajectory to inspire leadership and innovation for a sustainable maritime and oceans future. Without government support, universities like ours cannot survive. So thank you so much. Thank and you. And the industry, uh, of course, Cleo. is very yeah. hot, dear to my heart. So don't forget that. Yeah. No, so thank these you are my very, comments very for, for uh, now. Uh, Cleo, very, huh? very, very happy to have you here on, on this call and, and the enthusiasm and the, the background and the combination also from your prior work and your current work. Um, time, time flies, um, we are all getting excited. Um, we still hope sometime we, we, also, we get some questions here in the chat in the q and I have a couple of other questions that I received. Um, but we also have some interesting things to share from Anktat and I'm happy that Regina is joining us who co-led a special chapter we wrote on this, which is already available online. Um, I think we can probably resend the link also here in the chat. It is in, in, for the event, but uh, Regina, your thoughts on the panel. Thank you very much, uh, Jan, our moderator. And uh, let me just begin by saying thank you very much for the insights and the views shared by the distinguished panelists and by our speaker today. Uh, in view of the time, I want to try to keep it really brief. Um, but let me just say, obviously, UNCTAD uh, strongly supports ongoing international efforts, both to highlight and also to address these uh, issues related to the crew change crisis and other challenges uh, of the COVID pandemic for the health, safety and well-being of seafarers. There are a group of global key workers on which global trade and development actually depend, because over 80% of world merchandise trade uh, in, by volume is carried by CE, as we keep uh, telling everybody. And the majority of the world's seafarers is from developing countries. Um, we've already heard the number 1.9 million seafarers, the latest BIMCO ICS seafarer workforce report this year uh, indicates that the largest suppliers for both officers and ratings uh, are the Philippines followed by the Russian Federation, Indonesia, China, and India. Together, these countries alone supplied 44% of the global seafarer workforce that keeps global trade afloat, including through this uh, 
seemingly endless pandemic. Uh, as Jan has mentioned, UNCTAD has dedicated a chapter of the forthcoming Review of Maritime Transport 2021 to the COVID-19 seafarer crisis in response to a request by the General Assembly. Uh, as uh, those present here may recall, in December, the General Assembly adopted a resolution on international cooperation to address challenges faced by seafarers as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic to support global supply chains. And we have, um, we have uh, prepared this uh, chapter and invite all participants to read it. I don't want to spend uh, too much time going through all the details, but uh, some of our observation focus on four sets of issues. Some of these issues have already been obviously raised. The first is that according to the latest industry data, the crew change crisis is getting worse. Uh, that means including the time on board beyond the maximum of 11 months. Since the Neptune crew change indicator was, was launched in May 2021, two months later in July, the uh, proportion of seafarers on board vessels beyond the expiry of their contract had increased from almost six to almost 9%. That's an increase of over 50% in those two months between May and July of this year. And the number of seafarers on board for over 11 months, which as mentioned is the maximum period of time under the MLC, had increased from 0.4 to 1%, an increase of 150%. That is very worrying. And in terms of what does it mean? What's the percentage? What does it amount to? Uh, ICS estimates that as of July this year, 250,000 seafarers remain on board beyond the expiry of their contract. So there's obviously a great need for acceleration of collaborative efforts to address this situation. And as uh, other speakers today have, have highlighted to ensure compliance with legal obligations under the MLC and other instruments and to encourage more widespread adoption of these. The CFAR Identity Documents Convention is a point in is a case in point that has just been mentioned. This will be necessary to ensure decent working conditions and protect the health, safety and human rights of seafarers, but also to ensure the safety of global shipping because the uh, ships are one way or the other run by seafarers. Uh, an important development in this context is the proposal for an IMO assembly resolution to address the seafarer crisis that was prepared by the IMO secretariat under the auspices of the Maritime Safety Committee. The IMO delegation of the Commonwealth of Dominica deserves praise for initiating this process with partners and we hope could provide some additional information maybe as part of the discussions. Um, although the second point is, although key worker status is being more and more widely accorded to seafarers, relevant efforts need to go in hand with vaccination. And as we have heard and read in the press, progress in this respect is slow and priority vaccination of seafarers is not yet a reality everywhere. There are some countries, including Belgium, uh, and other countries taking these initiatives, uh, and they should be commended who are taking a, a pragmatic approach and are actually, actually vaccinating all foreign seafarers arriving in their ports. So this is a very interesting um, example that hopefully others will follow. And we've heard something about Singapore also earlier. Thirdly, the press and information from the organizations IMO, ILO, member states and industry still indicate serious practical problems in guaranteeing access to medical facilities and repatriation in accordance with international agreements. This, of course, must be very urgently addressed because this is a matter for today, tomorrow and next week. Uh, these kinds of incidents occur and a very pragmatic approach to implementing international agreements to this effect is really necessary and that is not yet a reality apparently. And fourthly, uh, sector specific guidance for this group of global key workers who are both critical to trade and to COVID relief and at the same time face significant exposure and very limited or no medical facilities while at sea needs to be regularly updated. This is a bit of a concern because there isn't an awful lot of very recent information uh, taking into, into account scientific insights, and we think this is very important. So this updating should be done in co collaboration, of course, with the industry and in the light of empirical information about outbreaks at sea 
and scientific insights about transmission pathways, variants, masks, ventilation, vaccine efficient efficacy against new variants, etc. We understand that an update to the last sector specific guidance from WHO, which dates from August 2020, is in preparation, but we don't know yet. It's not yet clear when this will become available. So all in all, while the mills of the intergovernmental machinery mill somewhat slowly, the practical challenges facing seafarers have crit reached critical levels and now need to be addressed urgently, effectively and pragmatically. And we would, together with everyone else here on the panel, uh, urge all stakeholders, industry, governments and international organizations to collaborate to achieve results and soon. I look forward to hearing uh, uh, the views of, of those in the audience uh, as part of the discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Regina. Overall, I think we are all footing in the same direction. And also over the last year and a half already, really the, the positive collaboration between ITF and ICS and ILO and IMO and, and UNCTAD, we supported where we could with research, with our influence in, in New York, for the General Assembly resolution um, and, and capacity building, of course, and with WMU. Um, and still, it's, we all agree it's not enough. Um, now, we have a few questions and, and comments, and, and you, I think you can see them. Um, I have four short questions. I will just run through those four questions. And then, because yeah, we promised ourselves not to go so far beyond, not every one of you will have answers to every one of those four questions. I would then like to go backwards, like first give the floor to Regina, then um, Cleo, then Brandt, and last but not least Steve to sort of conclude, come back to see if you have something to share about what has been said by all the others and to those four questions. The first one is a very specific question in the Q&A. If crew wish to take a vaccine in AU, I believe that's Australia, who should they contact? ITF, question mark. That's probably a relatively straightforward question. Second one, there's a question on training, like longer term impact, where the crewing change crisis and the difficulties now also have led to delays and, and shortcomings in necessary training certification and so on. That's a longer term impact what can should be done and what how negative how important is this uh, third question now then going even further beyond covid if there's light at the end of the tunnel if after this if we have actually there may be something positive coming out of it let's put it this way in the sense uh, by by having raised the concerns of the seafarers um, more awareness more digital solution better communication better collaboration I'm actually putting possible answer in, in your mouth <laughs> because I, I'm always trying to be the optimist. And fourth and last question, um, is this, uh, there is the MSC, there are many instruments also at the IMO. Is, is it more about that the existing international instruments are not sufficiently implemented or is there something that needs to be changed in the international legal regulatory framework for to avoid this thing? Uh, some, some, something like this happen in the future. So four questions, one very specific, one about training, one about beyond COVID, and the third one about, fourth one about the global regulation. Um, I hope that was more or less clear. <laughs> Maybe, uh, yeah, not, no need to answer all questions, but Regina, can I give the floor first to you again, then Cleo, then Brandt and Steve. Thank you very much, uh, Jan. Yes, maybe uh, to say something about the question about regulation and if it's a matter of uh, implementation. I think, uh, uh, you know, not that we, we know in each and every instance what happens, but uh, by and large, the regulatory framework is uh, not, not quite as bad. And if it were effectively implemented and, and uh, considered, even despite the practical difficulties, the situation should be much better. But as uh, our colleague from the World Maritime University said, the one thing is, in many cases, the relevant international convention, including the MLC, but also, for example, the Seafire Identity uh, Documents Convention and, and related um, uh, agreements haven't been adopted. That means ratified or exceeded 
uh, to buy uh, all states. In other cases, there isn't a clear indication what is the problem on the ground. And in other cases, it's that these, uh, these regulations, for example, uh, under, the, under the international health regulations, the WHO uh, provisions, uh, there is a scope for exceptions and exemptions for obvious reasons for public health reasons. So it is, of course, a difficult situation. All countries need to ensure that their uh, public health uh, situation stays under control, um, and that might affect some of the, these, uh, these issues. But uh, to be honest, some of the reports that have been, uh, that we know of through, for example, the press, um, Brandt Wagner mentioned an example of, of a crew falling sick, dying on board, then being, being stranded for weeks on end without even being able to repatriate the, 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 the corpse. I mean, this is, this is a so, sort of state of affairs, which just, there is no excuse for this. This must be doable in a better way. And uh, once again, given that seafarers are really cooped up together for a long time, for a long period of time, uh, I think it is extraordinary that not more effort is being made uh, apparently to consider specifically the needs of this, uh, this group of workers. So I, I, it, it's, it's a bit of a mixture of everything, I think, but certainly international legal instruments, um, their effective application on the ground is certainly lagging behind and more states need to encourage to, to do their bit. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Regina. And I was in the meantime typing an answer to another question that was, can we have Q&A? Because we have limited time here, but this networking goes on. Please send us emails I can share with the, with the colleagues. So by a lot of this conversation, we can continue also by email. Um, then going back, what's in the sequence? Um, Cleo, you have the floor. Uh, you're muted. I want to address the um, the last the last of the uh, four elements that uh, Regina referred to, and um, that is the uh, MLC and and the Convention 185. Those two, I would like to address those two, because I do think um, that the ILO has in place really a formidable set of two instruments. Uh, the MLC, we have seen the ratification rates of the MLC. We are now up to 99. Of course, there is still, I'm hoping that, and that's where um, I'm looking at brand uh, uh, ILO has now to really, you know, step up and uh, and do, um, <laughs> you know, and, and, and get more countries to ratify the convention because MLC has in it all the elements, in my view, to address the problems that CFRs are currently facing, all of them. The, I, I think that that MLC instrument is comprehensive. There is nothing extra to add to the MLC. It's about implementation. It's about countries ratifying that convention. So we already have 99, so that's the third number. But the other component, and I've written also about that, is the um, Convention 185. That convention is not sufficiently ratified to be, and that would have been a huge, um, have had a huge impact for seafarers if we, if 185 was more broadly ratified, because then all countries, it, it allowed for the interaction with among all countries with one uniform um, seafarers ID that had all the elements that would make it possible for them to transit and transfer across borders. That is that convention brand that the ILO has to pull on a bandwagon to run up in these times. This is the right time to tell governments around the world that they need to ratify 185 that has, that has all the elements in it to identify seafarers adequately, to enable them to transit and transfer like our the more modern passports of today. It's equity in our passports that we use for, uh, in, you know, in the developed world, I guess, still, you know, this, this, this electronic passports that we now have. So I, I do think that we have the tools, um, but we now have to take the, you know, I would, I would suggest that ILO take um, a new look at how they can 
uh, revitalize the push for ratification of 185. Thank you, Cleo. I'm happy to help Brent. <laughs> <laughs> Brent. Yeah, thanks. Uh, yeah, thanks, Cleo, of course. Uh, yeah, I was thinking the last two questions you asked, and one was um, late at the end of the tunnel first. And there is a, po a positive thing out of this is this level of cooperation, which, I mean, it's not only impressive in itself, but it's very impressive to the rest of the world. I don't think there's another industry that's cooperated so well between ship owners and seafarers, for example, as employers and workers organizations as the shipping industry during this, pan this pandemic. So hopefully that's built upon, you know, and, and, and uh, Steve and others mentioned the cooperation between ILO and ILO. Let's build upon that as well. We're working, we've talked about abandonment and hopefully we'll get a joint sort of a second round of discussions and improvement of our way of dealing with abandoned seafarers. Another thing that's positive is the uh, recognition of the role of seafarers and other cross-border transport workers. That the people now are paying attention to that. They really have caught on to it. The question is, what do we do with that? You know, because if this pandemic ends, people may forget. So right now there's an opportunity to take advantage of that when people see that, because it's in the press every day. Today it's in the press, big news. The due diligence guidelines that were developed, that's a pretty good thing. That's a, that's a new development. Whereas another tool to put pressure through the supply chain, through, through, well, through charterers and others as well to um, not only enforce the MLC or you know, make sure the MLC is complied with, but also the, uh, the uh, guiding principles and human rights. This is, this, 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 this is a positive thing. And of course, the recognition of the importance of the MLC, uh, which is happening, I think, in more states because it is a tool to counter what's happened, you know, the pressures in one direction. But also, I think we have to recognize that people are also seeing where there, I hate to say this, because I know it's perfect, but where there might be improvements, and that will be a discussion at the Special Tropical Committee of the MLC next year. They might find ways to refine this, you know, where we can do, make some slight changes to make it better. On this whole thing of uh, governments, you know, on uh, what can be done at a greater level of, uh, you know, and, and the whole framework that, that was asked, well, you know, they, there is going to be a discussion, we're trying to schedule it, and what's called the UN uh, Secretary General's uh, uh, Executive Committee, uh, where they get together the UN Secretary General and all the heads of uh, different agencies to put pressure through the UN agencies to make sure that not just the maritime authorities, and labor authorities, but also the other public health authorities and border control authorities pay attention to the AMLC in this. Because what's happened is, you know, maritime authorities and labor authorities have been promoting the MLC and implementing it, trying very hard. It's the other authorities that during this crisis have not done that. And so that's going to be something good. Um, SID, very important as Cleo said, because I mean, among other things besides traveling, the SID proves you're a seafarer. That if, if, if you've been prioritized as, for vaccination as a seafarer and you have a card that shows you're a seafarer, that seems to like it's a useful tool for then getting that vaccination actually to sort of putting that in, in, pro, in, in process. Then there's another thing that's outside of our scope, but the WHO is doing some things. And one of the things they're doing is they're looking at a possible post a pandemic response instrument, a new instrument. I think we should take a look at that and, and how it affects the international health regulations and see if we can influence that to make sure that uh, we don't have the same problem next time there's a pandemic, because we think there'll probably be more pandemics in the future, unfortunately. Thanks. Yeah, thanks a lot, uh, Brandt. Um, and Steve, before I give you the floor, where I will make your task even more difficult, uh, there are a couple of additional questions came in. Uh, one is about uh, enforcement. It's our colleague Mark Asaf asking, well, what about inspections like the ITF, ITF is conducting, but backed by some UN body, some stronger? And also last question here by Eva Liane Berger. Um, she apologizes for uh, coming off controversially, but <laughs> that's the idea here. To, if, if MLC really, really was working, or I believe you can see the question in the chat now, the, uh, the, or if there should have been more enforcement. And unfortunately, we won't have the time for everybody to comment on this very good question, but Steve, you will have to, you have to speak on our behalf and discussing this issue in, in thank, response to the thank, different thank questions. You. Thanks, Jan, and a credit to a fantastic panel. Um, I think I have to be a little bit controversial that, frankly, transportation is too cheap 
if we start at the beginning and the forcing of the cost down, yes, we understand it's critical to drive economies is part of our challenge. And we've heard, and you know, I have to say very frankly that there is some fantastically talented people in the UN agencies who have shared sometimes weekly our frustration in the inability to get all of these good, well-prepared professional instruments to be enforceable. And that has to be one of our challenges. That has to be an evaluation about when the world depends on transportation, and we've seen it to the minutest detail, but then you can have a seafarer who's jabbed six different times because the health authorities won't accept multiple <laughs> vaccinations. And it doesn't sound too healthy to me. We are advocating vaccinations, make no mistake about that. And unfortunately, the ITF isn't in a position to help our friend in Australia, but uh, you have to go to your national health authority. But we hope before the end of the year, we will be in a position to put in some kind of global solution. And then, but we have to work with the national governments. Brent said, um, and of course we respect government's responsibility to govern but the the health authorities need to understand our economies depend on our global supply chains they're built with the, you know this it sounds so cliche the just-in-time model means a lot of the storage is on those big container ships that, that Cleo mentioned and if you don't move them and let's say the ports of the world are working at 65 percent capacity at the moment compared to 98 before before covid hit so for us in the ITF, the, the issue that I think has come out of this, ultimately we're talking about humanity, we're talking about people, whether you're a truck driver, civil aviation worker, seafarer, docker, warehouse worker, we have to let those people know that we respect their contribution and we have to collaborate and collaborate and collaborate and ask these difficult questions about enforcement. Because, you know, there's many, many people that are listening and a part of this process have reached the highest levels of both legal qualification and academia, but when the crisis hit, we were not able to enforce the rules. And that's something that we need to find a way. And, you know, Cleo, I think if I get it right, and I'm not the expert on this, the Philippines has ratified uh, uh, the, the, the seafarers identification document. We need to follow their lead. We need to get that argument across because, you know, how long it takes us to fight our way out of this transition it's critical that the world's transport workers can cross borders. We have got so many horrifying stories, but I won't take too long. But I think for me that the, the question is the integrity of the people that have worked behind the scenes in all the places, including many of the ship owners folks, many of the regulators, so there's many flag states that we don't generally see eye to eye, but they've tried to do their best. We have to, have to, have to improve the system, respect the rule of law, and continue to collaborate so that this can never happen again. Otherwise, as Brent mentioned, we won't get tomorrow's truck drivers, we won't get tomorrow's seafarers. And Jan, you asked us to think about the challenge of climate and the automation and uh, just on the final point, we won't be able to answer those challenges if we can't make secure, decent, well-qualified jobs for the people, the young people, the men, and dare I say more women, um, to be in a position to make a significant difference to everybody. So thank you for the opportunity. And uh, I commit on behalf of the ITF to continue to support all of our colleagues, comrades, friends, who've worked so hard to help the seafarers. And I still believe we've made a significant difference, but we can convince governments to do so much more. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you all very, very much. We uh, had one question here about the, the key worker issue, which is what was in the resolution also at the UN General Assembly and uh, upon which Anktat was also asked to write the special chapter. Um, and we, while we were discussing this with the, that was led by the government uh, of Indonesia, uh, key, key worker depends on different countries, how they interpret it, but it did help. Having this resolution helped countries encouraged countries at the national level, whatever it is in their national level, to, to give transport workers, seafarers in particular, more rights than they would otherwise have, for example, during lockdown, travel permissions, and so on and so forth. 
So I, I hope uh, I see people, colleagues nodding because we have a bit run out of time. So I'm answering that last question on behalf of, of colleagues. Uh, I don't think there's a, an official UN-wide, either O-wide uh, definition. Uh, but, and, and we had discussed this when preparing the, the supporting Indonesia in this endeavor, but uh, it was a question of, of translation in the end. Uh, but um, we have all agreed together, ILO, UNCTAD, IMO, ICS, ITF, uh, to push for uh, declaring seafarers key workers. However we define it, we all agree they are key for our well-being, for our trade, what we eat, what we drink. Uh, and we need to continue uh, to support them. I thank all the panelists. Uh, we are not there yet. There's a lot of challenges pending, um, but I think well, we have done what we could with this awareness raising, information exchange, and uh, this very interesting insights from all of you. So I thank you all very much. The recording will be put on the same website where you could register. So if you forgot certain things, you, this recording will be available. Our report is on that website. Uh, emails will be there. You can, we, we, I hope we all stay in touch and, and hopefully on a more positive note for a next webinar on this topic. So thank you all very much. I wish you a wonderful Thursday evening, morning, afternoon from wherever you connected. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you, all. Thank you everyone. Bye bye.